This is a movie that John and I have been talking about for years now. Um, so way before the script was ever even written, we were kind of banging back ideas back and forth about this and about what it might feel like to shoot something that, you know, in essence feels a bit like a live action Pixar film. Um, and that's really what John has put on the page, I think, in, in you know, it's, a, it's incredibly emotional and it, it ebbs and flows. It's that make them laugh, make them cry, and bring them back to laughter. As we started shooting this movie, I, I've talked to a lot of people that, you know, they'll ask me what I'm up to. I'll say, oh, I'm shooting this film about imaginary friends. I've talked to people who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who will talk about, oh, man, I miss my imaginary friends. I had two when I was a kid, and their names were this and that, and they would kind of go into this sort of wistful, nostalgic, and not the least of which emotional kind of reverie of when they were kids and that time when they had that friend that was there for them unconditionally and always. I've known John for, God, I, I guess 12 years, maybe 15 years, I'm not sure. Um, long time though, um, yeah, we live near each other, our kids are friends, it's like, it's kind of the best of every possible world, you know. So shooting this movie has been, been amazing. To be shooting it here in New York as well uh, is such a rare opportunity. I think I shot one movie in New York, and it was 16 years ago. So this is, you know, this has just been a dream come true for us. I struggle to think of a, a filmmaker that hasn't, that that that's been more informed by their own parenthood and children than John Krasinski. I mean, he's. Uh, I feel like that it really cemented his his um, his language as a filmmaker. Uh, uh, you know, being a being a dad and being a husband and being you know um, the parent to two little girls. You know, I think uh, it sort of informs. He filters all of his storytelling through that prism, and I, and I think it's beautiful. He can. But what's striking to me about it is that he can make a movie that is as scary and provocative as Quiet Place and Quiet Place Two. Yet he can also do something as I know tender and unexpected and hilarious as Imaginary Friends. For starters, you have incredible talent playing our ifs. I mean, you know, everybody from Louis Gossett Jr. to, to Steve Carell to you know um, Phoebe Waller Bridge. Like it's 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 crazy the the level of talent that's attached to that. So that helps inform it a little bit. But it's been great. And you know, yeah, it's it's all about imagination. I mean, I've never had a, I've never. I'd, I'd never struggled with that idea of like acting against a tennis ball as a creature or an effect because that's our job. Our job is to place ourselves in that position regardless of what we're looking at. We've been all over New York, but but um, huge chunks of the film are, take place in Coney Island, which is obviously this incredibly historic amusement park um, that has a, a great, I think a pretty storied cinematic legacy as well. Shooting in Brooklyn and Brooklyn Heights has been great. Um, I've lived in New York for, I don't know, 12, 15 years now, and it's, uh, um, it's such a rare opportunity to get to shoot at home. So for us, it's been, for John and I, it's been great because, you know, a lot of the days that we're shooting, we're able to walk our kids to school and then go to work, um, which is just something I don't take for granted for a second. I met Kaylee in the audition process. She came in and read uh, with John and I and and you know it was like one of those situations like it always is it's it's really is always the same it's when somebody walks in and they just they just are the person you know within the first sentence that comes out of them you just you know even though we'd already read with some pretty striking and incredible young actors uh, the second Kaylee walked in she just spoke and you just knew I mean John and I kind of looked at each other it was almost like why are we why do, why continue with this charade of you know, the rest of these scenes that we knew right away. I had a kind of an imaginary friend when I was a kid. It was, it was Pookie was, <laughs> was his name, and he was like a bear, like a kind of a, looked just like a teddy bear sort of thing. And, and uh, my brother and I, my brother Jeff and I shared this imaginary friend back and forth, and it was like a really kind of a weird bond my brother and I had. And um, it's something we still talk about to this day, so... Um, this movie on every level really kind of resonated with me in, in ways that I both expected and, and didn't expect. I had always wanted to make a movie for my kids. Um, I had thought about a world that I would love to live in. Um, and honestly, it came out of 
getting to spend time uh, around an eight-year-old and a six-year-old and the years before that uh, a whole lot and getting to see the power of imagination. So I had this idea to do a movie about imaginary friends a long time ago. And I brought it to um, this up-and-coming actor named Ryan Reynolds. And uh, he and I were talking about doing a movie together. And I said, I have this idea about imaginary friends. And I'm still uh, figuring out exactly what it would be about. But would you want to be a part of it? And he was like, yes, definitely. And so I thought if I do a movie through the eyes of this little girl and actually show how imagination is not only um, this powerful tool uh, to have fun, but also this en enormous coping mechanism to make sense of things that um, might be difficult to make sense of otherwise. In my opinion, Ryan Reynolds is one of the most talented people we have ever had in this business, full stop. Not only is he clearly wildly funny, um, but he is so enormously talented in his performance. He has the ability to draw you in with his charm, uh, with his comedy, but then also make these hairpin turns uh, of emotion. He knows that um, timing isn't just about jokes. Timing is also how you get uh, an emotional reaction out of someone too. And I'm just so excited for people to see him in a role like this, which to be really honest, I don't think anyone else could have played. Clearly I am someone who is uh, completely immersed and married to the theatrical experience. For me personally, there is nothing like sitting in a dark room with strangers and experiencing something new. I think that the thing that makes movies the most theatrical, in my opinion these days, is to immerse people in a world, a world that surrounds you both in um, sight and sound. And I think that this movie is exactly that. It's not just a story that you want to see in a two-dimensional form, but it's actually something that you want to live in. You want to walk with this little girl, and when she meets these magical characters, you want to meet them as well. This movie is about um, you step into that theater with whatever was on your back during the day or whatever worries you had, and this movie will not only transport you to a place, uh, a magical place where you can um, experience something that you've never experienced before, but it will also allow you to look at the world when you go back out and in a different way. And if, you're, if you have stress, if you have fears, which we all do, it's not about the fact that they don't exist. It's about we can deal with them in a different way, which is um, more hopeful. So I think for me, if I had one thing I wanted people to leave this movie with, it's hope. Kaylee Fleming is one of the more talented actors I will ever have the pleasure of working with. She has um, the skill level of someone who has been working for 50 years. Um, I'm not quite sure how that's possible, but she has this contained confidence um, this unbelievable ability to take notes and do exactly what you're asking her to do, and all the while with a huge smile, and I believe mathematically every single take ended with uh, two hands up for a double high five, every single time. You would think that a movie about imaginary friends uh, would be strongly tipped towards the cast that is playing imaginary friends, and you might be right if it weren't for the insanely talented people like Fiona Shaw, who plays uh, Bee's grandmother in the most uh, amazing performance. Uh, uh, I love her so much. I'm, I'm desperate to uh, be around her constantly, whether I have to move to London or she has to move to New York is still up in the air. Um, we have uh, Bobby Moynihan, who I've been a huge fan of uh, for a very long time uh, from SNL and everything else he does. Uh, he is so uh, heartwarming, kind, sweet, and adorable in this movie. I think Bobby might be an imaginary friend, so hopefully he shows up on camera. Uh, he might be my imaginary friend. Um, and then Alan Kim, who plays the part of Benjamin, he's the other uh, kid in the movie. And he is a kid that uh, I think is a product of too many screens, not enough uh, time alone to uh, investigate your own imagination, but uh, things are presented to you. And so he, he doesn't realize that... Um, there's a whole world beyond screens that uh, he can tap into. And um, I remember seeing him in uh, Minari and just thinking that that was a titanic performance uh, from someone of any age, let alone someone who I believe at the time was seven or eight. Um, and now he's the, the ripe old age of 10 and still crushing in our movie. 
When we were going through the process of figuring out how to shoot imaginary friends, uh, the thing that kept coming up for me was shooting practically. Um, very similar to what we did in uh, Quiet Place 1 and 2. Absolutely, there are CGI elements to the movie. Um, but the more we could shoot practically, the more you believe that those creatures exist in your world. And the same uh, holds true for the imaginary friends. I had no intention of making a wildly green screen, blue screen world uh, that our actors were living in. Instead, I wanted to reverse it and have the imaginary friends live in our real world. The idea that imaginary friends are always with us and they never left us, um, even when we're adults, is sort of one of the big themes of the movie and that all you have to do is turn around and your childhood's waiting for you right there. It never went away. It is never lost on me how lucky I am to be living in this world of imagination. And this movie in particular, you know, I think before this movie, my kids thought I was an accountant. And so when they found out that I was actually making a movie about imaginary friends, they came to set for the first time and they got to experience all this stuff and sort of see behind the scenes and hang out with Kaylee all the time and get to meet the ifs in whatever form they were in at the time. And so this was the most special experience for me because I actually got to do it as a family the whole time. You know, doing Quiet Place with Emily was unbelievable. Um, to be married to the star of the movie and, and get to, to do that story was incredible. But actually to have your kids involved from the ground up. And so nowadays they're asking, you know, when does this come out and is this done? And when I explain to them that I'm in VFX and, you know, Blue's coming together and he's almost done and they, they're so excited about it as if they're going to get to see one of their friends that they haven't seen in a really long time. Violet's imaginary friend is Allie, who is a pink alligator that lives under the bed. And I said, are you scared of Allie? And Violet said, why would I be scared of Allie? She's under the bed to protect me from bad guys. And I went, okay. So Allie's in the movie, played by Maya Rudolph. And, um, and my daughter Hazel had an amazing imaginary friend. We were sitting around a campfire a long time ago, and when you first are exploring the world of s'mores, you realize very quickly that you can't leave the marshmallow in for too long or it lights on fire and falls into the fire. Hazel thought that was one of the funniest things ever, so she invented an imaginary friend who was always on fire. So it's a marshmallow that the top of it is always on fire, and he will also be in the movie too. I am so excited for my kids to see this and totally terrified for my kids to see this. Um, they're going to be uh, the, the most honest critics of my entire life. This is a huge, wild, fun movie, and it all comes from a place of total and pure love. It's, it's not just fun and uh, funny and adventurous and magical. It's, it's also very heartfelt because I think that when you're dealing with the, the things that are most important to kids, it is heartfelt. And the truth is, we all have a kid inside us. We just have to find a way to invite them to go back. And I think that that's, that's what I'm most excited about. One of my favorite characters is the character of Blue, who Steve Carell plays in the movie. And my idea for Blue actually came from an experience with uh, my daughter Violet, who, when she was young, used to tell me that my favorite color was purple, even though my favorite color was clearly blue. And after two years, I buckled. And uh, now purple is my favorite color. So when I was creating the character of blue, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to put that joke in the movie where um, this is a clearly purple character uh, whose name is Blue, all because uh, his kid was colorblind. And so, so you have the whole purple and blue joke all in, all in one character. Getting to work with Steve on this movie again was like no other experience. I mean to have such a shared history with him and as a dear friend and coworker at an office, um, to be able to, to dive into something completely different and see him be as talented as I always thought he could be in any realm. Of course, he jumps into the, the, um, the voiceover world. Uh, he seems to be having some luck with that. I mean, I don't think anybody brings that level of energy that level of comedy and that level of warmth all in one go. You know what I mean? He really is, when you see the character of Blue, um, bing, show Blue here. Um, when you see the character of Blue, it is innately the sweetest, funniest, most adorable character you've ever seen. Who can you get to be the sweetest, most adorable person? You go get Steve Carell, that's what you do. Fiona Shaw does one of the most beautiful performances I've ever seen. We were all weeping on set because when I first met Fiona about this movie, I said, and then there's this whole ballet piece and I wrote this thing and I can't wait. Fiona Shaw is, is one of my favorite people I've ever met in my life. Um, 
talk about a magical person. I'm not even sure she's a real person. She might be an if herself. Um, but I remember talking to her about it and saying there's going to be this amazing ballet piece and we'll get you, you know, a dance coach or whatever. And she said, oh, I did ballet till I was 16. And I said, what? And she right then and there just started to dance in front of me and do all these moves that she hadn't done for however many years. And I was blown away. And then I said, well, why did you stop? And she said, oh, just too old, too awkward and um, too tall. And so that is the line that she will say in the movie, which is, I was too tall, too old, and too awkward. Who wants to see an older person dance? And that's exactly what happens before she dances. And so it was all just so serendipitous and beautiful. And the moment she said that, I was like, that's what the movie's about. <laughs> so it was great. For me, uh, shooting practically is the most important part of any movie, whether it's all practical or there are visual effects elements, because your job is to bring people into the movie as honestly and in a real way as you can. And then introducing some magical elements, even in a quiet place. My job was to shoot zero green screen and make sure that we shot the movie as if it was the real world. And then my job was to drop in these creatures in the background whenever they were necessary. Um, and I wanted to do the same thing. My favorite um, movies and my favorite directors shoot everything practically and that is for a reason. It's, it's to bring you into that world in an organic way. If I can bring these actors into a world that looks and feels like the real world, then you believe that these imaginary friends are actually there. Ryan is one of the funniest people on the entire planet. Um, he's so, he's kind, he's caring, he's everything you could ever want in a friend and a co-star. Because he's so effortlessly hilarious. He's so into his character, he's so deep and he knows the industry well, he knows the business, he knows what's up. When I read the script, I instantly connected with her. Um, I just love how she's written. I, she has so many great qualities. She's creative, she is stubborn, she knows what she wants, she loves her family more than anything, and she's very different. Like, I've never seen a character like her before. Blue is a purple pom-pom, essentially. He's eight feet and three inches tall, and he's the most huggable thing in the entire world. He has short little stubby legs and the biggest heart ever, and he's just full of joy, and his laughter is contagious. Blossom, she's gorgeous. Oh my gosh, I love how she looks a butterfly. She likes to make tea. She's very calm and collected, and I guess you could say she's the mature one of the group. Like the way he writes, the way he directs, the way he acts, he can do it all, which is not normal. Most people can't do that. So he's pretty out of this world. Um, he loves what he does. I think he has a real passion for it. He loves this movie. He loves these characters. And that really makes a huge difference, I think, of how the story plays out. And getting to act with him was so fun. Bobby is one of my favorite people in this entire world. He is hilarious. Obviously, he was on SNL, so he knows all about comedy. Um, he's great. He exceeded anything that I could have ever wanted or hoped for for Stress Man. Bobby brought it to the table and up 10,000 notches, he, oh my God. I remember doing, what scene was it? Whenever he goes to the sink and he falls down, I had to sit, stand in the bathroom stall and just try not to laugh because he's so, he's so great. Fiona, I don't even know, I'm speechless. I can't describe her. If I could use one word to describe Fiona, it would be lovely. She's so rooted in what she does, and you can tell she genuinely cares about her character. She's so special, and I remember finding out that she was gonna play my grandma, and I was freaking out because I love Harry Potter. So I was like, oh my God, Mom, this is Aunt Petunia from Harry Potter, and I'm so excited to meet her. And she's completely opposite of Aunt Petunia. She's the sweetest person in the world. She's hilarious. She's charming, she's everything. Any good quality 
Fiona Shaw has it. This movie is my dream role. Like, these are my dream people. This is my dream cast, um, dream story. It's fun, it's heartwarming, it's family, it's comedy. It's everything that I've ever wanted. I really hope that the audience, as long as they learn one thing from it or take away something from it, whether that be to not take your loved ones for granted or to not bottle up your emotions and let them out or to embrace your inner kid, whatever it may be, as long as they take something away from it and they leave the theater smiling, that's all I could ever ask for. My character has sort of lost touch with his imagination. Uh, uh, as everyone gets older, you know, real problems come into life, actual problems. When you're a kid, you think you have all the problems in the world, but you don't. Uh, and when you're an adult, you realize you're just a large child with responsibilities. John is, is such a, a, a brilliant dude, and like, it's a beautiful story. It's, it's not like The Quiet Place, very different. Can you believe it? It's not the same audience. <laughs> but uh, no, it, it's, it's, it's beautiful. And uh, someone who has grown up, I had many, many imaginary friends when I was little and stuff like that when I was little. And uh, I was never little. Um, <laughs> um, but just having that imagination, I think I was somebody who had a very big imagination, very silly uh, kind of uh, a kid. And, and that carried on to a job and a career. Um, and John kind of is showing that in, in this. It's, it's, it's a beautiful story about, about not losing that, that part of you. I think audiences of all ages will definitely be into this movie. This is one of those movies that your kid wants to see and you can't wait to take your kid to see it and, and see it again. Don't mind seeing it again and again and again. Kaylee is absolutely wonderful. She's a phenomenal actress already. She, she was before she got here. Um, it's, it's amazing to watch her work, and she's a kind, nice human, which is, uh, which is also a, a beautiful thing. <laughs> Ryan's the greatest. <laughs> Ryan's absolutely wonderful. Uh, when he hosted SNL uh, uh, many, many years ago, it might have even been my first year, I just remember thinking, this guy's absolutely hilarious. It's a shame he's so ugly. And uh, uh, he's hilarious. He's absolutely hilarious. And uh, being in awe of him then, of his comedy chops then, and now, now uh, it's a shame that he's just never did anything with it. Blue was my imaginary friend. Uh, I am colorblind, and he is a giant purple uh, monster. Well, not really a monster. Well, yeah, he's a monster, but he's an adorable monster. Um, but I call him Blue because I'm, I'm, I'm colorblind. But I still so put together a nice purple and blue outfit with not, not knowing what to see. Um, yeah, and uh, it's been a while uh, since probably I've seen him because I need him uh, the most right before this job interview, and I'm very lucky uh, that he shows up. How would I describe the core message of this film? Um, to always remember to have uh, an imagination and to, that, that it, it, it's never over. You can, you can still keep going. And, and even though you're having a terrible day or you may feel like something is, is not going your way, it, it, there's always uh, some time when it will. There, there may not be right now, but... Uh, it'll come soon. When the film comes out, I hope audiences go see it with their family and talk about imaginary friends and, 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 and all that stuff. I don't think I ever, like, spoke to my parents about my imaginary friends. Um, no, I definitely did. My mom knew it. I had two imaginary friends. One was Ishka Bibble and one was Bag of Beefy. Working with John is fantastic. He knows what he's doing and he knows everything he wants to see. So it's really easy. 99% of the work is, is done. He's fantastic, and he's very kind and wonderful, and he has a family, and so does Ryan. And it's, it's weird to be at that point in my career where we're on set, not talking about where we're going to go afterwards. We're just swapping kid stories back and forth. It, it's, it's, it's nice to be in that part of my life right now. I'm, I'm enjoying it a great deal, talking to other, you know, just other really handsome dads. I was very surprised when I was asked to play this, but I, I had been, um, John sent me a text saying, will you be in my film? Uh, I thought, okay, 
of what? And then he said, and I'm getting Phoebe, who I who had written Killing Eve. She, she, we'll all meet for dinner. So we went to Phoebe's house for dinner one night. We had a hilarious night. And I came out saying, yes, I'd be in the film. But I hadn't read it or anything. So I played the little girl's grandmother. And, uh, you know, the situation is very interesting, very modern in a way. She has to come and stay with her grandmother, who she has not seen for some time. So it's both a very classical situation and a very unusual, uncomfortable one for both the grandmother and the girl. I can honestly say I thought this was one of the best scripts I'd ever read. I think it's an absolute whomdinger. And uh, because in the middle of it is an act of imagination, which anybody watching the film can plug into. Anybody, adults, children, everybody. And it makes you, you know, like really good writing, it makes you long to be in the reality of the film. It makes you want to believe it. I think John Krasinski is brilliant at writing things about families and his previous much darker pieces are about families and the bonds in families. And in, you know, in this film, there's a child, there's obviously the wonderful IFs, but there's mainly three adults who are floundering. They're just flawed. And I think, you know, it's, it's in that way, a very grown-up film about what it is to be a child with adults. It's not in any way uh, smoothing over any of that. And, I, and yet, you know, the adults too are out of touch with their childhood. And of course, all adults are out of touch with their childhood and, and do better when they get in touch with it. The real engine of the imagination of this film is John, who, who's written it. And because there's no cynicism in any beat of the imagination that he's put into it. There's no cheating. These, are, these creatures are as real to him as you or I. And so his enthusiasm and his to total logic abilities to place them, understand them, you know, uh, interrogate them, excavate the scenes, including them, makes you believe in it. And that way, I think that I don't know whether, you know, our imaginations are stimulated because we've still got to make the film, but I feel profoundly that it's going to ignite the imaginations of the viewer. John is unstoppable. I mean, he's, you know, I, I, you, you meet him at the end of a week and he's just as enthusiastic as he was on Monday. He seems to never get tired. And I think in that way, his imagination is being fed by the film he's making. This cast, I mainly work with Kaylee, the, my granddaughter, and she's a phenomenal actress, Kaylee, because she, she has the um, ability, the calm, the wisdom, the control, and yet the kind of openness to be both playful and entirely responsible. So she's a very unusual person. Not everyone can do that. I think it's a film about the remaking of families who are challenged. And so it really is about the power of family and the power of the imagination. It's about the desolation of childhood um, and it's about the uh, warmth that the human brain can conjure. After A Quiet Place, during the pandemic, when we had actually just done some good news, I think there was a desire to really rediscover joy <laughs> in the world. And this movie is that in spades. I think this movie is a movie for his kids, for him, for his parents, for every sort of generation. And I think that the emotional core of it is the idea that I think we come of age as people many times throughout our life. And I think this is a coming of age story for every generation. And so I think this is a love letter to imagination. It's a love letter to your children. It's a love letter to reconnecting with yourself at any age. I think that's what got us so excited about it. And that's sort of the root from which we built the story. He said, you know, what if instead of making a movie about imagination, you let imagination be a character in the movie? And I think for us, then applying that to who's the most universal way into this story. And if it's a movie about how adulthood and real life can sometimes temper the imagination right out of you. How do you tap back into it and how do you reconnect to that? And I think telling that story from a point of view of a kid who's grown up too fast uh, and is more adult than they are a kid and realizing that it's not yet time to do that allows kids younger, kids older, adults, grandparents to look back and go, well, maybe it's not too late. Maybe I can still tap back into that.
We've always talked about imaginary friends as sort of these, yes, adorable creatures that you can create, but really they're these like time capsules of our hopes and dreams and potential and all the ways in which we thought we, what we thought we could become one day. And then of course life takes whatever path it takes. And so it's the notion of, well, what if we can tap back into that? Ryan was attached to this movie from the very, very early days. I think John had Ryan in mind for the part almost maybe from its inception. And I think part of that was this character is such a dichotomy of, of emotions. And I think that you need someone who can play heart as much as they can play humor and warmth. And I think it, the trajectory of this character is that he views the idea that he can see imaginary friends in this world of imagination as a curse. And of course comes along to realize it's actually a blessing and he goes on this adventure with this little girl. So we have Blue, who is voiced by Steve Carell, which is as lucky as it gets. Again, I think that if you could ever envision the personification of a character like Blue, who is larger than life, who you want to hug at all times, and who can make you laugh and make you cry and make you feel, uh, there's nobody more perfect to do that than, than Steve. Blossom, who's played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge, and I think... Uh, a combination of factors there. I think John always had um, Fiona Shaw in mind to play grandma. And so the idea that you have these fun, proper British actresses playing uh, the, this wonderful part. And of course, Blossom was created in another era uh, and it was kind of modeled after a Fleischer cartoon. Um, and so it's really fun to see it come to life with Phoebe. Everyone involved in this loved the, the theatrical experience. And I think this movie is built for it in the sense, that in, in hopefully many ways, but I think it's it's a movie about kind of the shared human experience at any different point in your life and at any age in your life. And, and what better way to experience the shared human experience than alongside other human beings who are going through it and, and taking it in in the same way. 